there's a 2% variance in genes between races of people. And we're all the human race, but there's a 2% difference. Now that 2% difference is so big on the genetic scale that it would take multi millions of years to happen naturally through natural evolution. But it happened in 200,000 years. So what the scientists are saying is it happened artificially. They say they don't know how it happened artificially, but this is an artificial mutation. In 1927, during advanced excavations in the ancient Mesopotamian city of Ur, British archaeologist Leonard Woolley discovered the remains of Queen Puabi. This discovery was remarkable not only for the richness of the artifacts found with her, but also for the queen's unusually large skull. This anomaly has sparked significant interest among ancient astronaut theorists who suggest that such features may provide evidence of mankind's extraterrestrial origins. The large skulls found in various ancient cultures, including some Egyptian pharaohs and Peruvian mummies, resemble those described for the Anunnaki, suggesting a possible link or hybridization between humans and these supposed extraterrestrial beings. Queen Puabi's reign during the First Dynasty places her in a period closely following the alleged reign of the Anunnaki on Earth. If her skull indeed exhibits traits akin to those of the Anunnaki, it could serve as a critical piece of evidence supporting the notion that these beings were real and that they interbred with humans. All these places from around the world and all these tablets and scriptures and papyruses and cylinder scrolls are all connected to one race of people that came from the Pleiadian star system. There was a galactic war in that sector of the galaxy. And this war was so crazy, they were using something called a Brahma Honda weapon, which can destroy any man on three worlds. We're talking about a real Death Star that existed in ancient times. This weapon, once it was released, you couldn't withdraw it. You couldn't bring it back. There was no way to cancel it. And you can operate it from something called a Tablet of Destiny. And whoever had their hands on these Tablets of Destiny had control of the galaxy. And they were stolen a couple of times. So power had been jumping back and forth. Imagine if you were here in this, on this Earth and somebody blows up Saturn. We want to get off Earth because big chunks are coming our right. way. There were something called space refugees, my personal opinion. These people fled. This is how we got the Orion, El Debron, Zeta Reticulus, uh, you know, the Dog Star. All these other places began to, began to get inhabited. Earth was another targeted location as a breakaway civilization. Some of these beings, according to the Inumi Lish, landed on a planet orbiting a brown dwarf called Nibiru. And some people say, oh, Nibiru was never in any ancient text. Um, yeah, look at the oldest version of the Inumi Lish. It says Nibiru and it says Anunnaki. Uh, much later, in a newer version, which was a few thousand years later, another copy was made by Amun-Ra. He changed Nibiru's name to Marduk because he wanted to be the destroyer. These people decided, look, we're looking for breakaway civilizations. Us on Earth right now, human beings, if we just think that we're going to stay here on this planet forever, we're fooling ourselves. We need to also look for breakaway civilization. We got to create a breakaway civilization for ourselves. Our sun is already half middle age. It's going to die in five billion years, which seems like a long time, but that's a blink of an eye on geological time scales. And so these beings came here because they're like, look, we got to find a break a breakaway civilization. They were scanning Earth and they discovered from the from the scattered light, the same way we scan for elements, they discovered there was gold and other resources on the planet. Mm -hmm. coming just from looking at the light of the planet same way we do now in astrophysics so they said this is a great place so one guy risked his life to get through the hammered bracelet and made it through then he radioed back to nibiru and said hey i found everything we need right here and then they started sending people down a little bit at a time and they started building and when they got here enlil on a crystal tablet he showed to his sister it says ninma he showed her the building construction technique that's going to be on this planet he said for all time he already had it laid out, how he was going to build the cities, how he was going to build the plumbing. Everything, the, the way the city grid was going to be laid out, it was all on this crystal tablet. Now, what kind of tablet is a crystal tablet? Sounds like an iPad or something, in my opinion. Who sits around writing sci-fi stories in 6,000 years ago? So somebody wrote this because they were told to, and I believe that what they wrote was exactly what possibly happened. I think we're getting as close to the truth as we can possibly get. Now, when they began doing all this building and all this work, we were already here. We meaning our cousins, human beings, cousins, not homo sapiens sapien, but the prior version of us was already here. What they said was, okay, well, these people are here, but we're not going to mess with them. We're just going to continue to build what we're doing. And the EGG built and built and worked and worked for about 200,000 years. And we were already here? We were already here in small pockets around the planet. And uh, just indigenous peoples, you know, just living our lives as, you know, cave people and things like that. 
And then the Gigi got pissed off, as you know, in the Entre Hasis and also in the New List. Two different stories, two different time periods, same story. Now, okay, so can you explain exactly what the EGG were supposed to be? Were they yeah. were they part of the Anunnaki? Did they come here with the Anunnaki? They came with the Anunnaki. Okay. They were the workers. These were the people that knew how to do the grunt work. They knew how to build the structures based on the instructions or the blueprints. They were builders. And uh, they were Anunnaki. Now, Anunnaki doesn't mean they're all one particular race of people. It means they were... People who came from heaven to earth. Anybody from space that comes to earth is an Anunnaki. The civilization they built is the Atlantean. But even in the tablets, it talks about some of these people coming from different planets or stars, which means that they probably most likely were a mixed race of people. Sumer, often cited as the world's first civilization, emerged around 3000 to 4000 BC. The Sumerians developed cuneiform writing, a system using wedge-shaped impressions on clay tablets. These writings have provided invaluable insights into their society, including their pantheon of gods, among which the Anunnaki are prominent. The religious system of ancient Mesopotamia was polytheistic, with gods often depicted in human form and organized in a political hierarchy mirroring their own society. The Anunnaki, as the higher deities, were said to possess extraordinary abilities and knowledge, which has led some researchers to speculate about their true nature. In cuneiform texts, the Anunnaki are described in great detail, living for hundreds of years and wielding control over the entire world. Their knowledge spanned all sciences and arts, prompting questions about the source of their wisdom. Some theorists propose that the Anunnaki were, in fact, extraterrestrial beings who came to Earth on a mission. One of the most intriguing aspects of the Anunnaki story is the potential genetic legacy they left behind. Ancient texts suggest that the Anunnaki engaged in genetic experimentation with early humans, possibly creating a hybrid species. This theory is supported by the unusual physical traits found in some ancient remains, such as Queen Puabi's large skull. So, they got pissed off. They decided, look, we're working too hard. You guys are treating us almost like slaves now. We want to get a break. We want some relief from this work. And even that, we not only that, we want women. <laughs> we're pissed off that they didn't have any women. So this is where the sons of God fell from heaven. They came from Mars down to Earth in Genesis, and they took women with them back. So they, But in the Sumerian tablet, you get the full story where they go to Adam's calendar in South Africa. They encircle the camp of the god, which is Anu, the head, the head of the Anunnaki at that time. And they get ready to do war. And Anki and Lil and Anu come outside. They get their guards out there. Everything is tense. And they say, look, man, we're tired of doing this labor. We need a break. But what's interesting is, is that these people, you know, these Anunnaki people, they said, okay, well, we're going to go to war then because there's nothing we can do. You guys got to keep working. And then Enki says, wait a minute. I have an idea. There's an existing being on this planet. Existing. We can add our essence to it. So this is where they took one of the EGG, took some blood from the EGG. And they, it's not really quite clear how they did it or what they did. But in some way, it seems as if they combined that with the genetics of one of these hominids, our cousins. And they made a clone. Mix a GG, mixed hominid. Somebody they can control. In other words, they can communicate with, they can teach to a certain level, they can get them to do the workload, they can instruct them and they would listen. And so they were doing this genetic modifying and they yes, got it sounded they like they sacrificed it. one of the gods. Right. They call it a sacrifice. I don't know if they really would have killed it outright. It could be a term a term that's used to right. specify draining the blood out. I would be surprised if they really actually killed because when you get to that level of technology and advancement, the fact that you would kill somebody to turn to make somebody else live it seems a little weird it seems more like a huge blood transfusion or or some type of an organ donate it was something i don't know if the person really died because it never really says if they died or not the word sacrifice could be a word used when you don't know what word could exist in that right. spot you know it's potential now that's potential it could be a sacrifice for mm -hmm. real i'm not sure so they made this clone version of hominid slash ejg got it to work but so they, start, they started making more in these Hathor birthing houses, which the Hathor birthing houses, like at the Temple of Dendera, the Temple of Isis, and all these other places are there. They're still there. The structures are still there. I take people to see them every year. Now, what's interesting is these people, they couldn't produce babies on their own. If you take a lion and a tiger and you mate them, 
they're gonna have you're gonna have a ligand but you the ligand can't make any babies no matter how much time you try to mate it it won't be able to have any babies it can't if it's a male it won't be able to get anybody pregnant and if it's a female it won't be able to get pregnant certain combination of chromosomes don't reproduce so hmm. you have the horse and a donkey will make you a mule but a mule can't make another mule and so they started getting frustrated because they weren't making enough clones to get the amount of workload done they wanted them to reproduce on their own. Mm -hmm. And so that's when Isis says, you know, I have an idea. I'm going to take the baby to term. I'm going to give birth to the Adamu. So she takes an egg out of one of the existing hominids. She does something with the DNA and the gen genetics inside the egg, what we call today making a zygote. She puts it in her room. That's artificial insemination. And then she takes it to term 10 months. And there's a cylinder scroll with her holding up the baby saying, my hands have made it, the Adamu. That means first man. So now we have the first genetically modified, perfected version of Homo sapiens sapien. They tried to mate him with these other clones. Didn't work again. They said, damn it. So they then <laughs> took some DNA from him, made another female, and then made it them together and it worked. They said, we got it. So then they started making Adams and Eves in these birthing houses. Adams and Eve. Adam and Eve weren't the only two people on earth. They were, when they got here, there were already probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people already here. And then what happens is, if you take two people and you think you're going to get eight billion out of two, it doesn't work. What happens if you start having with your sister? You're going to have genetic mutations and by the third generation, there'll be stillbirths. Right. Not enough genetic diversity. So they created Eden, E-D-I-N. And Enki, he was known as Satan, the Lord of Eden in the text. And he would watch over this Eden. He had guards with, with weapons to guard the... Why would you have to guard this place with weapons? And he had people in there. And he was having mating times. They have specific times that they can mate and couldn't mate. And it was like uh, breeding, breeding people. And they were working on perfecting it. And uh, when Enki came and told Adam and Eve, who they were and how powerful they were and that they were at the same level as them, that's when they realized that they weren't dumb. That was the apple. The, the, the apple was knowledge. And then Enki, and Lil comes back and gets pissed off because he discovered what happens. And he said, then he starts calling his brother the devil. You don't listen to him. He's evil. But that was to distract the people to keep him in charge of the people. In the myth of Adapa, if you read that ancient tablet, the myth of Adapa, which is Adam, mm -hmm. you discover that he's been told that the way that we were genetically modified by Enki, he added a little extra into us that even us, we human beings, Homo sapiens sapiens, have the capability of superseding and excelling beyond, far beyond the Anunnaki when we reach our full potential. And it was programmed into us. He said also the knowledge and wisdom is already programmed into our body, into the DNA, that at a future time we'd be able to tap into it. That's in the myth of Adapa. And when Adam discovered all of this, he tried to commit suicide. He was kicked out of the garden, as you know. He tried to drown himself in the waters. And the guards came and pulled him out of the water, wouldn't let him kill himself. And then, as you know, they had Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel. And then Cain tells God, well, God is Enlil, Yahweh. Who's, who's he talking to? He's talking to Enlil, mm -hmm. who's known as Yahweh in the Bible. He says, you're going to get out of here and uh, for what you did. And Cain says, well, the people out there are going to kill me. That's what it says in the Bible. But what people? There shouldn't be anybody out there. Oh, there's people out there. He goes, don't worry, I'm going to put a mark on you. And that way they'll know your minds and they'll never touch you. And you'll find your wife when you get out there, which is exactly what happened. And he started the Canaanites. So people were here already. Adam and Eve were not the first two people on earth. Two people didn't produce eight billion people. That's right. a farce. Even, even in mainstream uh, science, when they talk about this one hominid that they discovered in Africa, everybody came out of this one lady. Come on. It's, it's, ridic it's a joke. It's an absolute joke. Genetics doesn't work that way. We all know that. Chromosomes don't work that way. We all know that. And what's interesting is you have a civilization being built that started off from by genetic mutating an existing hominid species on earth mm -hmm. to create a worker race. A worker race that was enslaved but didn't believe they were enslaved. They did two things. They installed a worship gene in the human genome, and scientists have now found this worship gene. When this gene is turned off, the person has no need or want to want to worship outside of itself or him or herself. When it's turned back on, the person has a feel of a need to worship something on the outside. When it's off, we go inside. So this worship gene was put in. They were masquerading as gods. They needed to put that in there to keep us loyal to them. So we would do the work thinking it would be giving praises to the gods. The concept of a worship gene installed in humans by the Anunnaki has also been proposed. 
This gene is believed to predispose humans to worship external entities, ensuring loyalty to the Anunnaki. Modern scientists have identified a gene associated with spirituality and religious experience, lending some credence to this ancient theory. The exploration of Mars has fueled further speculation about the Anunnaki. The landing of the Curiosity rover in Gale Crater on August 6, 2012 aim to evaluate the planet's suitability for human exploration. Discoveries of surface water have led to questions about the potential for life on Mars and its past. Ancient astronaut theorists, including Zechariah Sitchin, have suggested that Mars served as a way station for the Anunnaki traveling from their home planet, Nibiru, to Earth. If true, evidence of Anunnaki civilizations might be found on Mars, potentially in the form of pyramids or other structures. Sitchin's theories based on his interpretations of Sumerian texts, suggests that Nibiru follows an elliptical orbit that brings it into close proximity with Earth every 3,450 years. This periodic proximity could explain the Anunnaki's repeated visits and influence on human civilization. According to Sitchin, the next encounter with Nibiru is projected to occur in the year 2900, raising questions about the potential impact on humanity. As you look at the Emerald Tablets where talked about everybody was spread out around the planet and people were told to go around the planet and rule over different areas. I believe that the reason what makes you a Caucasian makes me a black person, what makes a, an Asian person yellow, what makes an indigenous American person uh, red is a genetic marker. That's the marker. In genetics, I started digging into this. That's what I discovered real science in real books in, in colleges. You go look it up. It says that there's a 2% variance in genes between races of people. Now, we're all the human race, but there's a 2% difference. Now, that 2% difference is so big on the genetic scale that it would take multi-millions of years to happen naturally through natural evolution. But it happened in 200,000 years. So what the scientists are saying is it happened artificially. They say they don't know how it happened artificially, but this is an artificial mutation. But when you look at the Sumerian tablets, you discover the Tower of Babel incident. It really explains what happened when Enlil who's known as Yahweh, comes back and sees humans building a tower into the heavens in one of these cities, duplicating what the Anunnaki had built. He gets pissed off because he realizes, oh man, Enki got me. These people are too smart. And he says, I got to destroy this. So he destroys the tower. In the Bible, he destroys the tower in the, in the Sumerian tablets. And he says, my seed shall not abide in man forever. His years shall be 120. That's the first thing he did. He cut our years down to 120 years. And what's the maximum lifespan of a human being in the most pristine condition, according to Harvard? university professors 120 years then the next thing he did was he separated humans and put them in different places around the planet just like the tablets say and then he confused the languages so that we couldn't communicate and collaborate anymore which is why there's all these different crazy languages and then on top of that he put a brand there's a brand whoever ruled over area brand your people we know that those are your people brand your people we know those are your, those are your people so there's this separation this divide and conquer tactic that's a super ancient divide and conquer tactic that happened long long time ago to separate and divide humanity into these sects and these different compartments to keep us from, from living longer, number one, keep us from collaborating with, with each other. And look how it's worked. They What they did, it's still working till this very day. That's how powerful it was. The notions of extraterrestrial beings visiting Earth is not unique to Sumerian mythology. Similar stories are found in circles around the world, suggesting a shared or interconnected mythological tradition. For example, the Flying Serpents of Central America, the Star People of the Ansazi, and the angels of biblical texts all describe beings descending from the sky. These cross-cultural similarities raise questions about the source of these myths. Are they independent creations inspired by similar human experiences? Or do they point to a common origin such as the Anunnaki? The widespread nature of these myths suggests that the idea of life originating from the stars has deep roots in human consciousness. The Anunnaki's influence on human civilization is evident in many aspects of ancient Sumerian society. The Sumerians are credited with numerous advancements that laid the foundation for modern civilization, including the development of agriculture, science, medicine, mathematics, and legal systems. These achievements appear to have emerged suddenly, suggesting a significant external influence. Ancient texts describe the Anunnaki as the bringers of knowledge and technology, which they shared with humanity. This knowledge included advanced construction techniques, city planning, and the creation of intricate irrigation systems. The Anunnaki's impact on human society was profound, shaping the development of civilization in ways that are still felt today. 
Deciphering cuneiform, the writing system of the ancient Sumerians, was a monumental task. It wasn't until the discovery of thousands of tablets at an Assyrian palace in March of 1814 that significant progress was made. Paul Emile Bada, a French scientist, uncovered a vast underground area filled with statues and inscriptions in northern Iraq. These findings provided tangible evidence of the Sumerian civilization and its sophisticated knowledge. Further excavations revealed the ruins of Ur, the legendary capital of the Sumerians and the birthplace of Abraham, according to biblical texts. The site included the Great Ziggurat of Ur, a step pyramid structure serving as the city's administrative center. This discovery confirmed the historical existence of what was previously thought to be mythological. Mesopotamian religion was a complex system of polytheistic beliefs with a pantheon of gods, both male and female. These deities were often depicted with human traits and organized into a hierarchical structure mirroring the political systems of the time. The Anunnaki were at the top of this hierarchy, considered the supreme deities. The Anunnaki were believed to be responsible for creating humanity according to some interpretations of ancient texts. They were said to have genetically modified early humans to create a worker race capable of performing labor-intensive tasks. This manipulation is thought to be the origin of Homo sapiens, with the Anunnaki's intervention accelerating human development and civilization. Zechariah Sitchin's theory suggests that the Anunnaki will return when Nibiru once again comes close to Earth. This return is projected to occur around the year 2900. The potential implications of such an event are vast, raising questions about the Anunnaki's intentions and the impact on humanity. Sitchin's interpretations of Sumerian texts propose that the Anunnaki's periodic visits have historically led to significant advancements in human knowledge and technology. If the Anunnaki return, it could result in another leap forward for humanity. However, the nature of their return, whether benevolent or judgmental, remains a topic of speculation. The ancient Egyptians spoke of the Duat, a realm that served as a bridge between Earth and the Divine. This concept is similar to Nibiru in Sumerian mythology, which was considered both a physical planet and a metaphysical realm. Nibiru was seen as a place where humans could interact with the gods, suggesting a connection between these ancient cultures. These cross-cultural connections highlight the possibility that ancient civilizations shared common beliefs about the cosmos and their origins. The similarities between the Duat and Nibiru suggest that different cultures might have been influenced by the same extraterrestrial beings or had similar experiences that shaped their mythologies. As humanity prepares for the potential return of the Anunnaki, it is essential to embrace the idea that we are not alone in the universe. Acknowledging our possible extraterrestrial origins could lead to a deeper understanding of our place in the cosmos and our evolutionary path. The promise of a return by extraterrestrial beings is a common theme in ancient texts. Preparing for their return involves accepting the possibility that these beings played a role in our development and may continue to influence our future. This acceptance could foster a more open-minded approach to exploring our past and preparing for the potential impacts of future encounters. The story of the Anunnaki offers a fascinating glimpse into ancient history, mythology, and the potential origins of human civilization.